Ta. Jeg vil på igjen. Så da tror jeg at dere hører meg litt bedre i dag. Er det riktig? Litt klarere stemme. Så jeg varierer litt i gangen, men i dag tror jeg stemmen min er rimelig klar. Ja. Rimelig klar. Så forelesning i dag vil handle om Network Externalities. The lecture today will deal with networks externalities and as you all know we skipped the last model last time and when I say model you remember from the last lecture we went through model one was uh, <coughs> price leader dominant firm dominant firm price leader you remember that and you remember the nice model contestable market. And finally, the model we ended up with last week was network externalities. And <coughs> you always, in this course, need to have a model. You need to understand the model. Very often it is like this one, where you can draw demand and supply in a figure, but you always need to understand the model to formalize the uh, <coughs> problem within a model. And this nice figure is a demand function. How come? This is a market where we start with. It could be a monopolist producing email, Facebook, a telecom service, where if you have many subscribers, it gives you an extra utility for all these subscribers already subscribing. The more subscribers, the more the benefit for all of them. <coughs> In Facebook, if there will be only one, it's not very interesting. But if all your friends are there, it's OK. And the same with <coughs> the email. <coughs> so we start with the market, with the monopolist that produce a net work commodity service <coughs> and we can just assume that we have 2 million subscribers at most and instead of the number of subscribers we are going to deal with the share of the potential market that actually subscribe so <coughs> F F is the share subscribing, and that varies from 0 to 1. <coughs> and P is the price <coughs> to subscribe, and the marginal cost is 0. Then <coughs> we have a willingness to pay that varies between 0 and $200 to subscribe. And <coughs> that willingness to pay, we call VI. VI is willingness to pay for individual I. And <coughs> we have a uniform distribution of subscribers in between 0 and $200 just to remind you it's a uniform distribution of subscribers then we know <coughs> that if the willingness to pay is VI and <coughs> we know that the utility will increase if the share of subscribers will be high 
then we define a utility function that consists of utility for individual i is equal to f the share of subscribers multiplied with vi the willingness to pay so the utility is higher the higher the willingness to pay to pay and the higher the share of subscribers okay so this is the product then we define the marginal subscriber and we call the marginal subscriber that just just has a willingness to pay that is just enough to cover the price <coughs> and that <coughs> tells you that price equal to the i margin multiplied with f is <coughs> exactly the equation where <coughs> you have the marginal subscriber then we have that the share that will not subscribe <coughs> <coughs> since we have a uniform distribution the share that will not subscribe is the i margin divided on 200 why 200 because <coughs> that is the highest marginal willingness to pay it varies between zero and two hundred dollars <coughs> then <coughs> we can conclude that the number of subscribers f will be equal to one minus vi margin over 200 and we know that vi margin is equal to p over f so we put p over f in that equation where we have the share of subscribers and we end up with the demand function f <coughs> equal to 200 f parenthesis 1 minus f parenthesis that is the demand function p is the price and <coughs> f on the right hand side is the share and what we actually do then is just to use that equation and then we come up with figure 5 5 5 5 so the demand function now <coughs> contains network externalities why come because we define the utility as a product of willingness to pay vi and f the share the market share this figure is a nice one <coughs> and <coughs> if we go to the peak five hundred dollars where f is equal to 0 0.5 from the peak on the demand function slopes downwards that is what we're used to the lower the price the higher the share of subscribers the lower the price the higher the share of subscribers but let's now say that the monopolist puts a price to subscribe equal to 37.5 because it's a monopolist he can just put the price that can maximize his own for profit and let's now imagine that he puts his price equal to 37.5 then <coughs> you could see that we will have two equilibrium where this price 
will intersect with the Riemann curve. Either we can have 1 or 2. Either it's 0 0.25 or it's 0 0.75. Now, and this is important with this one, when it comes to equilibrium 1, that's not a stable equilibrium. Why come? Because in point 1, can you see the blue line in point 1? From point 1 on, the willingness to pay, and that is what we have along the demand curve, the blue curve is higher than the price. What happens? Since the price is 37.5, starting at 1, <coughs> there will be a higher willingness to pay than what you actually pay. <coughs> and <coughs> the number of subscribers will increase. And that will go on till we reach the peak and then moving downwards all the way down to point 2. What happens at point 2? That is exactly where the willingness to pay is equal to the price. That will be the equilibrium. So here we have dynamic network externality forces that drives the market into growth. If we start at 1, we will end at 2. <coughs> what if <coughs> we just a little bit under 1, just marginally below 37.5? What happens then? Then the forces will drive the market downwards. <coughs> so if it's just marginally <coughs> no other one, we go all the way down to zero. <coughs> and this is a very interesting uh, point here. That is critical mass. If you pass critical mass, that happens in point 1, then <coughs> the dynamic forces will just move you upwards until you end up in 2. And <coughs> this is what is interesting with this kind of market. If there will be a newcomer, trying to enter this market. Do you think that's easy? If you start and you just have a small market share and you don't pass critical mass, you will have no subscribers. So for a competitor to enter, <coughs> you need to be able to capture a market share so high that you pass critical mass. And that is because of networks externalities. Because networks externalities will be in favor <coughs> of the incumbent that's already there, that has already <coughs> his position in the market. And when you try to enter, it is difficult to pass critical mass. Therefore, these kind of network markets easily ends up with market power. One company that will dominate email, Google, and so forth. <coughs> and <coughs> difficult to enter. And it will be a kind of market that will be dominated by monopolist. So, <coughs> just to remind you, this is now in chapter 5, the third model, and <coughs> here 
you need to remember how to develop the demand function, <coughs> how to understand critical mass, how to understand why <coughs> one is not a stable equilibrium, and how to understand why the market <coughs> just moves from one to two if you just pass critical mass. Two is now <coughs> market equilibrium. Okay. <coughs> then we move <coughs> to game theory. Here is <coughs> the introduction. And let's just start with the concept. <coughs> if you if you look at Norwegian television last evening. We had one example of players. Putin is playing in the gas market. Why come? And very often, game theory is really <coughs> what we can use to understand political actions. Putin is definitely a player for the time being. And yesterday he announced that if he will not reach an agreement with Ukraine and the contract they have with Ukraine, he will reduce the supply of gas to Europe. And that pipeline going through Ukraine is consists of 15% of the European market. 15%. And if that reduction will come <coughs> in winter time, he is playing rather tough <coughs> since so many countries, Poland, Germany, and so forth, will depend on gas supply during a cold winter. And Norway is definitely also a player here, because we deliver gas, and definitely we have to prepare to deliver as much as possible. <laughs> so we have to put pressure on our own fields to deliver whatever we can deliver during this winter. <coughs> and do you remember we discussed the game that we played in the salmon market. Do you remember that all of a sudden Putin decided that he will drop the import of Norwegian salmon? <coughs> he is a player. He acts strategically. <coughs> and he just stopped all import of salmon from Norway. But the Norwegian will have a counter move. What will they do? <coughs> and you remember, they will switch to an alternative market. <coughs> and when they have a high quality product and they play, they just reduce play over prices with high quality salmon, <coughs> just reduce the prices marginally. And all of a sudden, who has taken over all the Russian import? Belarus. Belarus. So on the news now, <coughs> they concluded that we are exporting more salmon <coughs> than we exported last year because we have had a price reduction and the demand from Belarus <coughs> has just taken over. So the strategy and the actions from Putin was not really a problem for Norway. We just switched. And a small reduction in prices, no problem. So <coughs> within politics, 
game theory is to understand the science of strategy. <coughs> and we are going to use game theory to understand the science of strategy, but within <coughs> industrial organization. <coughs> and when we start, we have to ask ourselves, <coughs> when do we have a game? When do we have <coughs> a game theoretic approach in our analysis? <coughs> the first one is we need to have players out there <coughs> with mutual dependency. <coughs> what is meant with that? <coughs> that is when <coughs> one player will know that if he moves, there will be a rival out there that will have a counter move. So he will have to change to optimize his payoff. <coughs> and he will also know that the rival will know that he is a player. They both know that they're playing, and they both know that what they actually will do will influence their payoffs. <coughs> so they play aware of that they are in mutual dependency. And for the first time, the only way to act strategically is always, if you have a rival, you always think, how is my rival thinking? What do you do then? You put your feet in your rival shoes and ask yourself what will he do? <coughs> you know <coughs> that you have a quarrel and I have a quarrel with my wife. <coughs> if we are looking for a solution, my best strategy is to put my feet in her shoes and try to think what is he thinking? And if she wants to have a good solution with me, if she will be smart, she puts her feet into my shoes. So we try to understand e each other just by switching shoes. <laughs> <coughs> and <coughs> that is an uh, important part of <coughs> game theory. You try to understand it to understand your rival's behavior. <coughs> and that is mutual dependency. Awareness is simply that the two players are aware of that this game is going on. And they always <coughs> maximize have a maximizing behavior. The agent strives for maximizing its own winning. <coughs> and what have we learned? <coughs> we maximize profit. Huh? We maximize profit. Next one. <coughs> we need to have players. W one is not enough. We need to have two or more players. We need to have moves. If you move, your rival moves, takes a counter move. So you need to have moves. You need to have outcomes. And outcomes is a combination of payoffs. <coughs> when we end up in a final solution, each of the players <coughs> have maximized their own well-being. They have a payoff. But for all payoffs, <coughs> in each cell of <coughs> final solutions, we have an outcome. And 
the outcome consists of payoffs for all players. In that cell, with that solution. And moves, we will often also call actions. Combination of actions or moves needs to outcomes of the game. So if both of the players are happy, they don't change when they see what their rival has done. So <coughs> none of them will change <coughs> when they see the outcome. The game is, <coughs> is over. Then we always ends up with one outcome <coughs> and we look for in all these games which outcome can we expect to be equilibrium <coughs> and the well-being of one player is called the payoff <coughs> next one <coughs> we just pass that one just move quickly over there. Uh, go further. Further. Mm -hmm. Further. <coughs> Maximizing behavior and rationality. Common knowledge. <coughs> we have maximizing behavior. Each player is assumed to make moves <coughs> to maximize its own payoff. And the players are rational. And information is very important because they always maximize with the information available. <coughs> so we have from this chapter on to a great extent to concentrate on the information available and <coughs> they maximize the profit always <coughs> based on the given information. Common knowledge <coughs> is when each of the player has the same knowledge concerning the structure of the game and <coughs> to remind you he also knows that his opponents have the same knowledge. So you know that they know, and you know that they know that you know, and you all know that you know that they know that you know, <coughs> and that is the common knowledge. <coughs> next one. Then we move to the next uh, transparency series. No, the next one. That is chapter. Okay, now we go to the next one. No further. No. We go to to uh, to. No, no. Next, the next series. This one is next. Uh, the next one. <laughs> no. That is chapter 7. We look for chapter 7. There is one more. <coughs> Here's where we start with chapter 7. And now, for the first time, <coughs> we start playing. There are two players out there. <coughs> They play over prices. They produce turbines, electrical turbines. It's General Electric and it's Westinghouse. They play over prices and they both maximize their own profit. <coughs> then they can choose either high price strategy or low price strategy. And you have here four outcomes. 
each cell is an outcome. Each player has two moves or two actions to take, either play high price or low price. And you can see if they both play high price, the outcome is 100-100, which means that the payoff for each <coughs> company is 100. <coughs> and that is a sell, that is an outcome, and 100, 100 is profit, and 200 is the maximum profit that they can <coughs> that they can earn in this game. <coughs> if they both play low price, then <coughs> the outcome is 80, 80. And if we add 160, <coughs> if General Electric play high price and Westinghouse play low price, <coughs> then the high price player will lose a large market share <coughs> and General Electric will end up only with a profit of 25, while Westinghouse was the smart one to play low price <coughs> with a very high market share and a profit of 140. And if we add 165. And if General Electric play low price, <coughs> it is quite symmetric. Now <coughs> they will earn 140. Be the smart one. And the high price player, Westinghouse, will lose market share, ending up with only 25. So, this is a game of normal form. It's a simultaneous game. And this is called the famous prisoner's dilemma game. <coughs> this is a prisoner's dilemma game. <coughs> because <coughs> both players, you can easily see that both players <coughs> should very much mm -hmm. want to collude <coughs> to play high price. Why come? Because they both will earn 100 each, <coughs> 200 totally. <coughs> so they should like to collude and play high price. <coughs> but <coughs> here they end up playing low price. Why come? Let's now see how we can find a solution. And now we look for what we call Nash equilibrium. Uh, always from now on, you will hear me, hear me say Nash equilibrium over and over and over again <coughs> because every time when we look for the solution we ask ourselves what will be the Nash equilibrium <coughs> and the definition is very simple <coughs> Nash <coughs> got the, was the Nobel Prize winner several years ago <coughs> and <coughs> you have probably seen the picture the movie with Nash <coughs> being quite insane and <coughs> his definition of equilibrium <coughs> is quite complicated <laughs> so to really prove <coughs> Nash equilibrium is not that easy and that is proper mathematics <coughs> but when we deal with Nash equilibrium it's very simple this is an important research finding <coughs> and it's helpful for us because we can just understand what is meant with Nash equilibrium. <coughs> and Nash equilibrium is always when <coughs> the two players 
have been playing against each other ending up in a cell you see here we have four alternatives ending up in that cell where we have no incentives to change when there are in that cell where none of them have anything to achieve by changing they don't regret when this game has been spelled out they are in that cell where none of them have any incentives to change then we have Nash agreement how can we find that Nash agreement then we start with General Electric putting his feet in Westinghouse's Westinghouse shoes and General Electric asks himself if General Electric will play high price <coughs> what will Westinghouse do? If General Electric play high price uh, Westinghouse will definitely when he is in his shoes he will just see that mm, 140 that will be the pay <coughs> the payoff if the alternative is high price low price is higher than 100 that will be the outcome for high price high price <coughs> so General Electric will put the circle <coughs> around 140 circle around our because he will understand that Westinghouse if General Electric play high price Westinghouse plays low price and then General Electric asks what if I play low price and again he has his feet in his rival shoes he will definitely see that he will not play high price why come 25 is too low because if he plays high price at no price he will have 80 so you put a circle around 80 now General Electric has done his job what will Westinghouse do? exactly the same he will put his feet in General Electric shoes and now Westinghouse asks if I play high price <coughs> what will General Electric do and he will see from his point of view and his point of view is now General Electric if he plays high price Westinghouse then General Electric will play no price 140 is higher than 100 <coughs> and now General Electric will ask what if <coughs> Westing if I play low price then he will conclude that 80 is higher than 25 and I put a circle around 80 can you now see that we have one cell with two circles and <coughs> If we have one cell with two circles, that is always natural. Since <coughs> in all other cases there will be an incentive to change. Let's now look at 8080. Do General Electric have any incentive to change? <coughs> no. Why come? If General Electric moves from low to high, the payoff goes from 80 to 25. That's lower. What about Westinghouse? Will Westinghouse have any incentive to change? If he moves to high price, 80 is higher than 25. But now, and this is because this is a prisoner's dilemma here. What about high price, high price? If 
we go into that outcome, that cell consisting of 100, 100. Do any of the players there, if they are there, do any of them have an incentive to change? <coughs> Which one? 140 is higher than 100. Uh, and that is for both Westinghouse and General Electric. Uh, and why come they don't collude? <coughs> because if they play this simultaneous game, they will end up in 8080. Uh, why come they don't agree <coughs> and just meet and agree that let's play high price? It's too stupid to play low price. <coughs> because if we play low price, <coughs> we lose 20, both of us. <coughs> Let's just come up with a contract. And the contract will tell us to play high price. <coughs> Why don't they do that? <coughs> huh? But why come they don't agree to play high price? It's not allowed. <laughs> the antitrust law tells you <laughs> that if you play, if you agree in the contract, hundred hundred, you will be put directly into prison. <laughs> so that's where, <laughs> if you play here. You just end up in <coughs> a prisoner dilemma solution. And after the break, I will try to um, explain you why I come. Break! Yeah! <coughs> <coughs>